So, good afternoon. Uh, it's really good to be back at CNI. Uh, Chris and I have divided this briefing into two parts, the bad news and the maybe not so quite so bad news. And in, in my traditional role as Cassandra, I get to go first with the really bad news. So we just heard Herbert tell us a lot about how to publish on the web the right way. Uh, the bad news can be summed up in two parts. One of them is that people who publish on the web don't actually pay any attention to what Herbert says. <laughs> and the second one is Herbert was gossing over some uh, rather hard issues uh, along the way. So, uh, it's not your grandfather's web any longer. Uh, well, I am actually a grandfather, and I'm old enough to remember the web the way it was. Actually, I'm old enough to remember back a long time before there was a web. About this time in 2015 will be the 50th anniversary of the first program I ever wrote. Uh, a couple of years later, I started life as a Cambridge undergraduate and encountered computer graphics. Uh, this is a DEC PDP-7 with a 340 display in it, which is how I started doing computer graphics. And uh, just before that, uh, one of the smartest people I ever ended up meeting uh, co-authored a paper on computer graphics entitled On the Design of Display Processes. That was Ivan Sutherland. He introduced the idea of the wheel of reincarnation as applied to graphics hardware, the idea that the design of the hardware was cyclical. It started out between, uh, with a fixed function I.O. peripheral that over time grew into a programmable I.O. processor that ended up being a fully functional computer connected to a fixed function display. And uh, that wheel is still rolling right along. Uh, when we started NVIDIA 20 years ago, we designed a fixed function graphics chip. Almost all our competitors, and six months after we started NVIDIA, we knew about over 30 other competitors. They pretty much all designed fully programmable graphics chips. It was one of our key performance advantages that allowed us to get, for the very first time ever, arcade games running at full frame rate on a PC. This is Sega's Virtua Fighter on an NV1 chip preserved on YouTube. The bottleneck was the frame buffer memory, and the advantage we had was that we used every single memory cycle to render graphics. All these programmable people had to take some of the memory cycles to fetch instructions out of the frame buffer for their program. Of course, now, uh, NVIDIA's chips are fully programmable GPUs, in 20 years, they've gone halfway around the, the wheel from fixed function to fully programmable. Uh, the wheel also applies to graphics and user interface software. The early window systems like SunView and the Andrew window system were libraries of fixed functions, as was the X window system, which ended up being very successful. James Gosling and I tried to move a half turn around the web with a system called News, which was a user interface environment fully programmable in PostScript. PostScript is actually a pretty neat programming language. Uh, but we were premature, it didn't work out. Uh, what's this got to do with the web? Well, the half turn around the web that James and I couldn't manage has actually happened on the web. Uh, the web that Tim Berners-Lee invented was in a practical implementation of Ted Nelson's utopian concept of Xanadu, a web of documents connected by hyperlinks encoded in a fixed function document description language. That web was pretty easy to ingest for preservation because a crawler could visit the page, easily find the links in it, follow them to other pages it needed to ingest. And it was relatively easy to preserve once ingested because the content of each document changed infrequently, so two visits in succession would probably obtain the same content. Uh, the phenomenal success of the Internet Archive was based on this model. Here, from the Wayback Machine, is the front page of BBC News from more than 15 years ago. Uh, the only difficult aspect was um, replaying the, the preserved content so that the links resolved to their preserved targets rather than uh, their current targets. And it wasn't until the work that Herbert's just told us about, about Memento, that this part of the problem was resolved. 
But as we should have predicted based on the history that I went through, uh, the web we all use today is a half turn around the wheel from that web. That web's primary language was HTML, uh, document description language. The browser downloaded documents and rendered the fixed set of primitives they contained. Browsers still do that, of course. Once a network protocol like HTTP or HTML gets widely used, it can't really be changed in incompatible ways. But mostly what browsers do these days is download and run programs in the current web's primary language, which is JavaScript. JavaScript is a programming language, not a document description language. Your browser is only incidentally a document rendering engine. Its primary function is as a virtual machine host. So I use a Firefox plugin called NoScript. And this screen grab shows that at least 11 sites wanted to run programs in my browser as I visited the front page of the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. So Chris and I organized a workshop last year to look at the problems this evolution of the web poses for attempts to collect and preserve it. And here is a list of the problem areas the workshop identified. Now, clearly, I don't have time to go through all of these um, individually in detail. Uh, for that, you should check the, um, the document that the workshop generated. And you can find it, and you don't have to take notes about my part of the talk anyway, because my, the text will go up on the, uh, my blog, blog.dshr.org, at the end of this talk. Um, and then we'll incorporate first things, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, I take a lot of care writing these things. When they're written, they're done. I don't want people seeing previous <coughs> versions of what I wrote. Uh, so I'm going to try and abstract out of this mess a, a, a few big picture problems. First, in order to preserve content from the web, you need to be able to access it. Increasingly, as news disappears behind slightly porous paywalls and sites use social network identities to gate access, this is becoming more difficult. Equipping a crawler with a credit card to pay for access is not really a practical approach. But the problem is compounded by another trend. Sites that <coughs> forbid access, for example, because the content is behind a paywall, and show you a login page, no longer do so with an error code, such as a 403 forbidden. They put up a login page with a 200 OK. And this is a result of the, uh, this behavior. This is uh, an article from the defunct journal Graft as preserved at the Internet Archive. And the uh, message here is this item requires a subscription to Graft online. This from the Clocks Archive is what the article looks like uh, if you actually have a subscription. Uh, a web archive full of pages explaining that the actual content is inaccessible may be an accurate reflection of the state of the web at that time, but it's not really a great way of preserving our digital heritage. Uh, determining that some content that was delivered with a 200 OK code is actually not valid content to pres preserve is hard. The lock system is designed to preserve subscription content. So this is a problem that we face every day. And we have to write really crafty per custom, per site, login page detectors in order to handle it. So when somebody says HTML, what you think of is something that looks like this, uh, which this looks like vanilla HTML, but actually it's an HTML5 geolocation demo. Most of which, what you actually get from web servers now is programs like the nearly 12 kilobytes of JavaScript, which is included by the three uh, script lines near the top of the page. This is the shortest by far of the three files uh, and looks exactly like a program, right? Uh, a crawler collecting the page can't just scan the contents to find the links to the next content it needs to request. It has to actually execute this, the program to find these links. And this raises all sorts of issues. The first is the program may actually be malicious and a lot of them out there on the web are. Uh, so its execution needs to be carefully sandboxed. 
even if the program doesn't intend to be malicious, its execution will require an unpredictable amount of time, which can amount to a denial of service attack on the, br on the crawler. So how many of you have encountered pages that froze your browser? <laughs> uh, everybody's nodding. Uh, executing may not even be slow enough to amount to an attack, but it will be a lot more expensive than simply scanning the page for links. So ingesting content from the web just got a lot more expensive in compute terms, which doesn't help the whole economic sustainability is job one problem. And then again, it's um, easy to say execute the content, but the execution of the content depends on the inputs the program obtains. In this case, the inputs are the geolocation of the crawler and the weather at the geolocation of the crawler at the time that it was crawled. In general, inputs depend on, for example, the set of cookies, the contents of HTML5's local storage in the browser that the crawler is emulating, the state of all the external databases the program may call upon, and the user's inputs. So the crawler has not merely to run the program, it also has to em emulate a user mousing and clicking everywhere in the page, looking for behaviors that trigger new links. But we're not just finding links for their own sake. We want to preserve those links and the content they point to for future dissemination. If we preserve the programs for future re-execution, we also have to preserve some of these inputs, <coughs> such as the responses to database queries, and supply those responses at the appropriate times during the re-execution. Other inputs, such as the mouse movements and clicks, have to be left to the future reader to supply. This is very tricky. And there are all sorts of other issues, like you have to be able to fake the uh, secure HTTPS connections and so on. Re-executing the program in the future is a very fragile endeavor. This isn't because the JavaScript virtual machine will become obsolete. It's very well supported by an open source stack, several open source stacks. It's because it's very difficult to be sure which are the significant inputs you need to capture, preserve, and resupply. So a trivial example is a JavaScript program that displays the date. Is the correct preserved behavior to display the date when it was ingested to preserve the original user experience or to uh, display the date when it will be re-executed, which is to preserve the original functionality? There's really no right answer. <coughs> so among the projects that are exploring the problem of preserving executable objects are Olive at Carnegie Mellon, uh, which is preserving virtu <laughs> virtual machines containing executable objects. But I don't believe it's really exploring preserving their inputs. And uh, Workflow Forever, uh, another of Carol Gogol's projects, which is trying to encapsulate scientific workflows <coughs> and adequate metadata for their later reuse into s research objects. The metadata includes sample data sets and corresponding results so that correct preservation can be demonstrated. They've just written a paper showing that generating the metadata for the re-execution of a significant real workflow is a major effort. And uh, even for workflows, which are a simpler case than generic JavaScript, Workflow Forever has to impose some restrictions in order to make it work. You can think of this as analogous to PDFA, which turns off all the hard to preserve aspects of PDF. Uh, for the broader world of web preservation, the HTML A approach isn't likely to be robust enough, even if we could persuade websites to publish two different versions, one of them for use and one of them in HTML A for preservation. Well, an alternative that preserves the user experience but not the functionality is, in effect, to push the system one more half turn around the wheel, uh, reducing the content to fixed function primitives not to try to re-execute the program, but to try to re-render the result of executing the program. The YouTube of Virtual Fighter is a simple example of this kind. Uh, as with, um, it may be the best that we can do to cope with the special complexity of video games, most of which have complex DRM and uh, server-based backends and things like this. In the re-render re approach, as the crawler executes the program, it will record the display and build a map of the sensitive areas with the results of activating each of them. You can think of this as a form of preemptive format migration, which is an approach that both Jeff Rothenberg and I have been arguing against for a long time. 
as with games, it may be this, that this, while flawed, is the best we can do with the programs on the web we have. So another question is, what on earth are all these programs doing in your browser? Uh, mostly, what they're doing is capturing information about you so that it can be sold. Uh, I won't shed a lot of tears if we fail to preserve this aspect of the web, but some of the captured and sold information drives what you see in the page, such as the advertisements. So I've never understood why archivists think that preserving spoof ads is important, whether they're selling fake products or real products, uh, but preserving real ads is not that important, even though they dominate our political discourse. <laughs> uh, so the programs that run in your browser these days also ensure that every visit to a web page is a unique experience, full of up to the second personalized content. The challenge of preserving the web is like that of preserving theater or dance. Every performance is a unique and unrepeatable interaction between the performers, in this case a vast collection of dynamically changing databases, and the audience. Actually, it's even worse. It's like preserving a dance performed billions of times each time for an audience of one, who is also the director of their individual performance. So we need to ask, what we're trying to achieve by preserving web content. We haven't managed to preserve everything, preserve everything <coughs> going so far, and we can expect to preserve even less going forward. So there are a range of difficult, different goals. At one extreme, the Wayback Machine tries to preserve samples of the whole web. Now, when Brewster originally told me that this is what he wanted to do, I thought he was nuts. Uh, but I was totally wrong. A series of, of uh, samples of the web even if they're noisy, uh, through time, turns out to be an incredibly valuable resource. In the early days, the unreliability of HTTP and the simplicity of the content meant that the sample was fairly random. The difficulties caused by the evolution of the web are introducing an increasing systematic bias towards the pages that are easy to capture. Uh, in the LOX program, at the other extreme, we sample in another way. We try and preserve everything about a carefully selected set of web uh, pages, mostly academic journals and books. The sample is created by librarians' selection. It's a sample because we don't have the resources to preserve every academic journal, even if there was an agreed definition of what, uh, of what an academic journal is. And again, the evolution of the web is making this job gradually more and more difficult. What we're preserving more and more is the easy to preserve parts. So, what, we're going, what web archiving is about is preserving a sample of the web. We're not going to get everything. Uh, and the web ev evolution is introducing a systematic bias into this. And in order to combat this, we need to have a diversity of approaches. Most web archiving at the moment is done by the Internet Archive and other people using the same tools as the Internet Archive. And this is dangerous because everybody's got the same systematic bias. Uh, and the good news, to transition to Chris, <laughs> is that at least Memento provides a way of unifying diverse collections from the web into a single resource that people can access uniformly. Okay. Chris. Um, yes. Is it going to okay, try to switch? Sorry. One. I think if we escape, I will do. Yeah. And there we go. Uh, so what I'm going to attempt to do is provide a little bit of hope, uh, <laughs> a little light at the end of the tunnel. Um, as you can tell from, from this slide, which actually is produced by a project called uh, 10X, which is working on the semantic web end of the spectrum of, of this visual, um, the web is an incredibly complex ecosystem today. It's not any one... Um, uh, set of techniques, approaches, implementations. It's a diverse network of everything you can imagine and all the things that we haven't thought of yet that somebody in their garage is, is going to put out there in the next two to six months. Um, and as archivists in this context, we are 
uh, charted with trying to come up with pragmatic, scalable, sustainable approaches to try to sample and collect and preserve as much of this material as possible. And as David pointed out, there's a whole other set of issues relating to access to these materials. Um, because we can't cover the full spectrum of all of that today, what I'm going to try to concentrate on is what are some of the um, innovations and experimentation happening on the collection and data preparation side of the equation that enable the access. Um, there's a lot of additional uh, research and, and innovation happening on access, but we're not going to be able to talk about all of that uh, here today. So in this context, um, even looking at uh, whether you're taking an entire national domain and crawling uh, sort of every registered entity within that, uh, within that um, sphere, you're going to touch upon everything, at least in these three squares and a few things that start to spill into what we're referring to as sort of the ubiquitous web, um, which gets a, a lot more complex. But today, we, we sort of regularly address sort of those three. And what we used to think was that smaller, more curated uh, collections of content would be easier to manage. And um, unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, if you even try to create a capture of the federal uh, congressional branch of the US government, you will hit every single thing um, displayed in, in this visual above. Um, the, you know, the spectrum of content that we're uh, wrestling with on a day-to-day -day basis continues to be more and more diverse, as, as David articulated. So what I want to do is try to set the stage on how are we sort of a approaching this. And so first and foremost, it's important to understand what sort of the classical model of web harvesting uh, looks like. And that's um, specifically you're asking a question. Um, of uh, a resource, usually um, in the model of you're identifying yourself as a particular client. You might be an iPhone 5, you might be uh, a Firefox web browser with this uh, particular version, but you are identifying yourself in a specific way, you're, you're asking a specific question, and then you're waiting for uh, the answers to that question to be returned. You're examining the output um, and then uh, identifying what pieces of that response are important for adding to the information that you now know is out there and need to go and visit. These are primarily unique URIs, but occasionally you're also identifying specific MIME types that need uh, closer attention or special processing and um, analysis. So this is sort of the, the classical model of, of a traditional web harvester. Um, a lot of what we're basing this on, of course, is the, the uh, most widely used open source web crawler, Heratrix. But there are lots of other proprietary crawlers out there that obviously uh, uh, use this, this same framework. Um, in, in terms of trying to talk through where things are evolving, um, it's important to understand the difference between uh, how a crawler interacts with the resource and how um, a traditional client, even if you're mimicking that, that client in kind of this traditional harvesting context um, uh, might be. So uh, browsers are really sort of optimized for getting only as much as you need to display that particular view at that moment in time that that end user is, is experiencing. Um, and then a browser can respond, obviously, to inputs that allow you to go deeper and deeper um, into that resource. Uh, a crawler can only you know, get additional content that would be initiated and identified by a user interaction. A, a, a crawler can often not, as a standalone entity, execute a script um, and discover links. There, there are extractors that have been designed and developed and embedded in order to try to um, uh, mimic that behavior, but it's not as, uh, it doesn't act in the same way as a, as a browser might. Um, and so a lot of what you're, you're having to do with the crawler is contain it a little bit because it can quickly overwhelm a server and um, you know, cause uh, unintended consequences for interaction of other users with that resource, which is unacceptable in general you know, uh, web activity. So there's a lot of uh, 
rules that have to be uh, structured in order to guide uh, the behavior of a crawler while it's um, in, in progress. Um, and depending upon what kind of institution you are and what rights you hold, there are specific rules that must be obeyed or should be obeyed or might be obeyed in different contexts. And, and this is where all of the gray zone comes into play and why there's so much complexity even when you get down to the end of the momentum end of the spectrum when Herbert was referring to access rights and, and issues that that has. You can have a public web archive, but you might not be able to view any of the video content embedded in pages because there's a live restriction that's published out on the web by the owner of that content that says, nope, sorry, you can't see this. Um, and depending upon whether you are the national institution that is legally mandated to collect and make that accessible again, um, it may only happen within the four walls of your reading room um, and not over the public web. So those are some of the things that, that come into, uh, into play between, uh, between the two resources. Um, and this is just a, a quick visual that gives you a little bit of an idea that when a browser goes out to a website, um, you know, what all the things are that are happening uh, simultaneously in terms of collecting the resources that might need to be assembled in order to, to view that. So what's happening in the web in general, so this is not specific to cultural heritage or academia, um, the proprietary uh, commercial web is also spending a lot of time integrating uh, browsers and traditional crawling methods primarily for discovery, um, for uh, supporting sort of the search engines that we all know and love and have come to depend on um, in our day-to-day -day lives. However, the difference is, is that those engines just need to be able to discover the location of a particular resource and try to identify meaningful text and context. It might be metadata that they can collect around that resource and surface that back up in, in a discovery context. Um, when you're talking about an archival capture, uh, the bar right now is set very, very high in terms of you're trying to recreate an experience that uh, perhaps a human being sitting in front of a device experienced at a date, at a point in time, at a location, um, on the web. <laughs> you know, so you're, you're taking all of that into account and attempting to not only capture and preserve it, but then have a chance of re-rendering that context at some point in the future. So when I, when I talk through this quickly, please keep that context in mind. Um, there's a lot of uh, tremendous commercial innovation that we can take advantage of, but it only gets us so far, and then we as a community have to sort of carry it further from there, because until some of the uh, corporate compliance legal compliance that is now affecting um, publishers around the globe um, really comes into effect and there's a mandate to preserve this content for you know, more than 10 years, um, we're probably not going to see as much innovation there. Um, however, we do think that personal web archiving uh, will continue to provide some interesting innovations uh, for us as a community because more and more individuals have their entire uh, lives in digital form um, across a wide array of uh, sites that publish and aggregate and maintain this content on their behalf, whether it be photos, videos, um, blogs, you know, other types of, of content. And so again, they're starting, the commercial sector is starting to tackle some of the same issues that, that we are. Um, in general, uh, the experimentation with browsers have fallen into three camps. Uh, you have uh, extractor modules that are written for traditional crawlers and embedded, uh, the idea being you send a, a set of locations uh, to a browser emulator um, that may be a fully instantiated browser or a headless browser that basically records um, the communication between a client and server, records all that information, passes it on to the crawler for, um, for collection. Um, you also have these standalone headless browser clusters that are being used for similar purposes, primarily for um, uh, preceding uh, data collection, uh, quality assurance uh, during and, and following a crawl, whereby you can look at all of the resources that are written to a particular repository, compare it with the communication that you uh, have um, 
documented and determine whether or not um, everything has been captured. If not, it then gets queued up for either um, a special uh, process to go out and explicitly grab a particular file um, and or uh, maybe just as part of a, a, a typical patch um, cross cycle. But you also have on sort of a, an additional end of the spectrum this concept of a more fully functional um, engine that allows uh, site publishers to test sort of their design and implementation of standalone websites. Um, that infrastructure uh, is largely available in open source format. There's a number of different projects and programs out there. Um, much of the International Internet Preservation Consortium community has started to standardize on solutions that integrate Phantom JS. It just happens to scale particularly well. There's some other uh, benefits from this particular uh, solution. Um, but that uh, approach is being used as a standalone mechanism for actually uh, browsing out using scripts to browse out, collect content, and write using um, an archival file format called the work file for web content. So that's actually um, a capture mechanism. Uh, we use it at the archive to regularly capture YouTube video, video at scale. Um, there are weeks when we you know, uh, are capturing millions and millions of, of videos and writing them uh, directly to work. It's not integrated with some other crawl process. Um, there's also uh, experimentation going on with recording and snapshot generation. So if you can't actually capture everything to render the experience that a, an end user might have, as David pointed out. Um, it's not just being used in, in video game context, but also just to say, OK, every registered entity in .com, let's take the slash page and take a snapshot of the live resource. Because at least at this date and time, we can have um, an idea of what the default uh, representation was, that if you're not logged in, what did you see? If they don't know anything about you. Because the crawler doesn't. Uh, always have an identity. We can give it an identity. Um, there are mechanisms, as, as David described, to uh, create a login, to create a, a persona. Um, but in general, if we're trying to do a sampling uh, at a very uh, shallow level across an entire domain, it doesn't have an, ad uh, an identity, and we're uh, presuming there's no login associated with, with that experience. So these are just some examples of some of the, the browser work that's ongoing. Um, but what's more interesting to look at is uh, recent uh, initiatives around merging uh, browsers and crawlers. Um, as it turns out, uh, the Heratrix open source crawler uh, makes a, a set of synchronous requests. Now we could modify that software to also support asynchronous requests, but right now it's, a, it's, it's heavily architected around synchronous requests. Um, so one of the things that we were trying to do to address uh, integrating kind of the browser mode and the crawler mode was trying to avoid um, issues of, of scalability. We can't wait for hours for all the resources to synchronously return. Um, we also uh, don't have the luxury of um, having to revisit the same content over and over again. It's incredibly inefficient. So the crawler in its own right has mechanisms for maintaining this. But when you introduce another um, element like the browser, which is trying to call everything at once in order to create a particular view, um, how do you go about managing and maintaining that? So I want to talk to you about three um, uh, implementations that are, are starting to try to uh, address this. Yeah. I'm just going to get my clock going to make sure I have it. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the key projects, um, most of these have been incubated by members of the International Internet Preservation Consortium. That's a group of institutions that are constantly trying to trade technology, best practice, um, and openly uh, do even engineering exchanges where people will go for months at a time and try to help d uh, develop specific solutions. But also regionally, we've found more and more sort of the emergence of um, uh, projects that are, are trying to open up and, and create solutions that are not web specific, but actually address a broader array of content types and, and repository issues that uh, institutions might be facing. So right now, we have a project um, uh, that is really incubated out of open planets um, that is uh, trying to look at integrating um, a 
browser extractor module into Heratrix, replacing one of the modules that was designed to try to execute JavaScript uh, and discover links. Um, so they uh, have implemented the code. It's publicly available on GitHub. Um, they are implementing at web scale for the .uk domain. Um, they are sending every registered entity through uh, this extractor module to try to identify all the content that might be missed um, by a, a traditional crawler, but they're actually replacing uh, the extractor. Uh, we have colleagues at ENA, which is the audiovisual um, uh, national archive uh, in France. Um, they have uh, a slightly different workflow. Um, theirs is they crawl a fixed body of resources that publish content within their cultural uh, uh, domain. Um, they crawl everything and then they uh, identify through data mining and other techniques where there are holes in the process and they take those resources and then route them through uh, a browser but they're using a proxy to try to ensure that there's no duplication between those those two efforts that there's unique capture of resources and and not um, a broad base of, of duplication um, a final project uh, that got off the ground uh, as part of the NDSA here in the United States um, was centered on the uh, federal elections of 2012. In that context, rather than sending seeds uh, or targets that may be used to um, start a crawl process, uh, what uh, was done there was um, uh, the creation of a hybrid model where you're using a traditional ext link extractor in combination with uh, a browser-based extraction that also integrated a proxy to try to deduplicate content. Um, what was routed through the browser was primarily, uh, initially it was all HTML and, and, and scripts that were identified by MimeType. Um, later, due to all kinds of um, factors, we ended up uh, biasing to script only. Um, we hit some scalability issues that even with 5,000 resources, um, the delays and some of the impacts on those individual uh, sites were significant enough um, that we needed to actually focus entirely on the scripts and, and not on uh, the HTML in, in its entirety. Um, so those are just uh, three implementations where this is happening. Um, and to give you an idea of what we're finding with, uh, with some of these experiments is, um, and this is just uh, you know, one uh, baseline test I'm, I'm using for illustration. There are dozens and dozens of, of these uh, experiments that have tried to document uh, the differences. In general, if you're, if you're dealing with browser only relative to um, uh, traditional link extraction only, you're missing about 30% of the content. And the reason is, it's really hard to figure out how to tell a machine how to be a person and execute everything that might be happening in every resource across a broad spectrum of resources. It's not so hard to do that if you have the time um, and you have the mandate to do it on a resource by resource basis. So if you're a site owner and you're doing site-based testing, you might have your quality assurance team doing this as regular practice to save you on manual quality assurance of a particular web resource. If you're archiving a journal and you have a particular mandate to try to um, optimize exactly how you need to get in there and collect all of the specific publications, then you invest the human time in order to describe what that process is looking like. If you've got 5,000 seeds of websites that are thrown up only for an election by you know, dozens, maybe um, more, in terms of number of, of publishers and, and publishing frameworks, there's no human way possible that in the window of time that these sites appear and disappear that you can uh, provide that, that manual um, guidance. So you have to come up with general rules of thumb that you hope to apply across as many of the resources as possible. So that's why you're seeing that, that degradation in uh, content not found. When you combine something like a PhantomJS implementation, which has the ability to operate as a fully render, you know, fully uh, full browser instance or a headless browser instance in combination with um, a traditional link extraction, you actually see an increase um, in the content that's discovered and able to be collected in a timely way. So, um, you know, we're, we're definitely uh, seeing huge. Uh, benefits from going down uh, this hybrid path with even just these two components in, in combination. 
The problem is, is that um, uh, the processing overhead is, is significant. Um, you know, none of us in this room are, are Googles. We don't have thousands and thousands of servers that we can run crawlers in parallel on um, on an ongoing basis, you know, 24-7, 365. Um, so we don't, we can't scale rapidly enough or in a sustainable enough fashion to address all of the execution that would have to go into this. So once again, th th these are not perfect solutions, but they're getting us closer toward at least beginning to um, uh, be able to collect and, and have uh, the ability to uh, re have representative samples that were at least equivalent to the, H the web 1.0 days. Um, so I want to talk to you just very briefly about some other techniques that again are being used in combination but are not directly linked to the, the crawl process. This is happening as a pre-process, as a parallel process, or as a post-process. Um, one of the most significant um, areas of infrastructure and architecture uh, by far is data mining and analytics. Um, we operate a 1.3 petabyte Hadoop cluster. Um, at uh, the Internet Archive, and if you're interested in, in learning more about that, we publish um, all of the information about the configurations and um, how we allocate uh, MapReduce versus other tasks in the system. But the important part uh, to understand about this is this is a piece of infrastructure that's used by every Fortune 1000 company globally. Um, it is a critical piece of infrastructure that's here to stay in terms of the web in general and how people are interacting with uh, web data at scale. Um, and web data at scale could be 10 resources all the way through to the millions that you might see registered in a, at a national domain level. Um, it's frequently used to identify the difference between an embed versus an outlink and to place, pri uh, to place priorities on collection of those res resources and to differentiate those. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into also identifying um, uh, different MIME types that we can then route through other capture mechanisms. Um, or in, in some cases, we need to take, for example, an embedded piece of social media and actually connect it to a direct uh, archive of a feed that's completely uh, running uh, separately from sort of a, a, a crawl itself. So I guess what I would emphasize from this is um, there's additional diverse methods um, that are in being used um, in practice by all of uh, the partners that I mentioned um, and some innovative up-and-coming companies that are trying to do this in, in more of a, a commercial context. Uh, but for anyone engaged in archiving of, of the web, um, there's no one set of techniques that's going to work. Um, and unfortunately, it's not just uh, the browser uh, crawler integration that I described. It also requires uh, additional forms of capture that would enable us to have additional perspective on the samples that we're, we're collecting and then attempting to make available for research and access. Thanks. Okay, so have plenty of time for questions.